stage is yours. Okay. So yes, the uh, little history of Cybrix. So in the beginning of 2019, we had the idea to convert or to to make a VR version of the Brick Breaker Arcanoid uh, game, a classic one, into VR. We started out um, with uh, concept designs, uh, and the first version was in uh, some kind of spaceship where you play Cybrix. Uh, but back then, it had, had a different name. We, I will come to that back uh, later. Um, so here's some concept designs, uh, early stages. And the name we came up with back then was Quash. Here we can see then also the, the actual gameplay of Quash. Uh, the gameplay was very similar to the current release from, from the core gameplay, just in a visually completely different uh, scenario. Um, then we really, that was developed uh, for PCVR. We then realized that um, we want to port the game to the mobile headset of uh, Quest. And with that, we also wanted to redesign uh, the whole game because we wanted to find something that looks good and performs well on the Quest. So we came up with uh, different concept arts, different ideas that could work well on a mobile headset with ideas for like an arcade style version of the game to a more like simplistic version and ended up then what we liked most was a Tron neon style inspired version um, as the game released yesterday. These are concept arts. We are then the first version of the game created and different ideas for different levels. You're still in concept art. And then that transferred into VR as the game looks now. And then we launched in 2021, November on App Lab. Um, what was very important to us uh, in gameplay wise of Cybrix is that it's a fast, Based uh, gameplay that the physics uh, feel good, that you're in control of the ball, and that there is not much of waiting time that we experienced uh, is, is 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 very important that you are constantly like moving and and have the the same experience as you would play a, a real squash game in real life. Um, then on App Lab released, we, as you may, might know, on App Lab it's hard to uh, discover games. So we tried multiple uh, marketing strategies. We had a try before you buy campaign where you can try the game for 20 minutes. And that was to some extent quite successful in the meaning that those who uh, tried the game, more than 50% actually purchased the game afterwards. So that's uh, quite a high number, as we think. Um, but even though uh, the try before we buy didn't reach that many people, we also uh, had a campaign for one month back there in July where the game was free for a whole month. So we get more people into the game, we get more reviews. Um, but the, the crucial part was that we decided to make the game multiplayer and also add mixed reality. And how we did that and why that is then Roger's part. Um, so yeah, we had the problem that um, a single player, like the good part is um, Cybrix is focused on moving quite a bit. Um, and those people which enjoy it always mention how they actually can use it as an exercise um, 20 minutes a day where they try to beat their previous high score or compete with their friends. So that was very good. Also, the reviews were... <laughs> it's probably our highest rated game we have currently released because people, it, not many people find it, but those who find it and play it really seem to love it. So that was really a good indicator. The problem is it was not enough um, for the full store release. So we had the chance, if we 
could add multiplayer and a mixed reality element to the game, that it would be possible to release it on the actual official store, um, which we were highly excited about. Um, because as you might know, uh, being on the store, at least we hope, gives you a way easier way to get discovered. People can search for it and no one uh, will be warned that the game is dangerous every time you click on it with a big pop-up. So we had high hopes that we need to make anything possible to release it on the store, but we had a very tight deadline, meaning we had maybe nine months, six to nine months to basically manage to get it all working with multiplayer um, and onto the store. Um, so we're going to kind of go to the next slide. Um, so we had a few requirements, right? Um, multiplayer, there are many different types of, or MMOs to uh, things which um, are just meeting apps, and all of them have different requirements and uh, different specificities, what you need to have in the way you implement the multiplayer. We had um, a relatively complex set of requirements, so it needs to be very fast paced. So the gameplay needs to be fast. Um, it shouldn't break the bank. That means if you would need to, uh, if there are some frameworks out there, if you use them, you pay probably more than you sell the game for. So we need to find something which can run in an affordable price range that we could sell the game as a one price only and not on a subscription basis. Also, the main other problem we had is it was physics-based. Um, and especially if you have two player playing with the ball, um, they need to play fast and that it feels basically like single player, but made for multiplayer, which is always um, a challenge. Um, and also because we wanted to have it that um, you can have a competitive match that it should not matter who hosts the game or who started or created the, the game. It should be fair for both players. So both should have exactly the same experience and it should be fair, which is evident maybe, but very hard to actually accomplish. Uh, and also it needed to be production ready in the time until release. Um, and so we could only look at frameworks or um, possibilities which could already be used in that short amount of time and would be fully production ready and supported. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So what we looked at uh, is evidently the, the, main, the game itself, um, the single player one Cybex we had on App Lab was mono behavior based. So we first looked at, into norm core, netcode for game objects, or uh, photon fusion, um, for those of you who have known it. And those all are really good for certain types of experiences. Um, but for Cybrix, none of them allowed to play, uh, none of them actually fulfilled any of the requirements. Um, photon fusion, unless um, you do some other things like it's very different for the host of the player compared to the one who joins it, especially um, for the physics-based part. And so we wanted, because it's more like a competitive sports game, we needed to be sure that it's um, absolutely fair. That was one of our high requirements. So we looked at what else could be out there, what else could work. And there are two ECS-based uh, versions. And one of them is Quantum and the other one is Dots Netcode. And we already released another game, which is multiplayer based on App Lab, based on Photon Quantum. And so we knew it's the fastest way to get an experience working, but we also were very excited about Dots and Netcode because that also has a fully physics-based um, predicted with rollback engine, which also is very exciting. And so we have, we have uh, also other projects which use currently Dots Netcode. So we try basically both and give both of them a chance. And after a relatively short amount of time, we saw that just the complexity of dots Neko for, so, for such a game is a lot higher. In Quantum, within a week, we had the first prototype and it felt like single player. Um, also, the pricing and everything was very evident. The lobby system is already there. Like there's a lot of things there, it's production ready. Dots Netcode was what was at that time not production ready. And Quantum, it has a uh, limited physics engine in terms of precision and there's some other things you need to be worried uh, like careful about but Cybrix fit perfectly in the use case of um, Photon Quantum and so we decided to go with that and I think in hindsight we can say that was the best decision we made <laughs> because it it was incredible how multiplayer was not once an issue or like you know testing it in the editor, in single player, and validating that everything works, and then in multiplayer, 
we had nearly no kind of hiccups where we only discovered it in QA or after uh, you know playing for a long time that things didn't work or break because it was over the networking code. So Quantum has a very unique way to do networking. Um, it's very cost effective. And for this type of experience, I think it would was just the best solution we could find. Of course, that means you need to know how to code in an ECS way. So basically, Quantum is a, like a different engine baked into Unity, um, if you so want. So you need to learn a completely different way to to use um, to, to use the physics engine, to use gameplay code and everything. It's way closer to dots um, of the Unity technology stack. But once you understand how it is, it feels like you develop a multiplayer a local multiplayer game imagine like the in the old times where you sit on the couch um and you connect the multiple controls it's basically you have to only think about this problem all the networking is basically taking care for you and it's lightning fast to implement something um and that allowed us basically to go to the store within the limited time frame we had and even add everything we planned um and be ready and relatively uh, completely Rel relatively close to bug free as we could have only hoped for and we could release it. So that doesn't mean every game out there should definitely use code on quantum, right? It just means based on your requirements of the game timeline and what you want to achieve and what it is for, um, different frameworks have different types of advantages and capabilities. And for us, code on quantum was definitely the correct choice. And we could not believe how good it felt, to be honest the first few times we tried um, and how fast we managed to get the core working. Um, and I think that is the main thing we want to cover. Um, we have currently now one cooperative mode, which is the most challenging one from a network perspective that it feels good. Uh, it means two players play with the same ball. So there's not like you can, some networking um, tricks is that you um, have ownership on the ball, for example, and then only when you when the ball passes to the other side, then you switch ownership and other things. Um, but for here, for, for the co-op mode, the ball can go uh, to the other player at any point in time, and you can even move to the other player's field and play with their ball. So we need to have something which works, and that worked basically out of the box when we use Quantum. And the competitive versions as well work really well. So even if you have one ball in play and both players could hit them, we never saw visual glitches which were like, problematic for gameplay, even if we played against people which were further away. Um, and Phil, you want to say something about the trailers and how we, you know, try to showcase multiplayer? Um, yeah, well, for the trailer, um, it was a little bit uh, a challenge because we were not able to record real mixed reality. So we came up with a, a different solution. So what we did is that uh, we recorded uh, the footage inside the headset and then recorded then people playing in front of a uh, green screen and added them into the recorded gameplay of, of the quest. So it uh, is not completely accurate what you see, but it, it what the, the advantages uh, it has compared to like mixed reality recorded like with a uh, lift, a solution is that it's a very dynamic process because in the headset while you record footage you're constantly moving and uh, it gives that dynamic that you have in the game uh, transfers it better in my opinion to the, to the trailer or uh, in a different way to the trailer it has a different feeling to it um yeah and then we also did a, a short trailer um version uh, where we just show like people playing and the game footage as a as a simple version of it and we will see which one uh, performs better than yeah we're currently testing because one has more of a story a little bit um of someone playing the game and getting better at it and the other one is pure gameplay and we are currently testing out different ways of what appeals more to people on the store what makes them more likely to click and experience the game um, and we have no numbers yet, so we have no idea how it performs, but we're at least happy that we find our own official store with Cybrix, which has been a very long time in the making. Perfect. Thank you. I mean, uh, at least we have a more idea on the development side as well, uh, how to, and Paul is here with us from ShapesXR. He will cover the uh, design side of things. 
but I would like to open the stage to people here since we have 10 minutes left. Um, any questions to Holonetic team on the development side, design, gameplay design side, or store success side, if you want to hear more about some details. Of course, they just released the game. They may not evaluate, measure the results. Any questions? Feel free to open your cam and ask. Um, so the question is if you should ask in the chat or live. You um, can do both. You, uh, you can do both. You can do both. I mean, uh, I saw um, I saw there was one question about if we already had had the single player mode implemented in, in an ECS way, and no, we didn't. At that time, we only focused on mono behaviors, and uh, the physics um, from Nvidia was basically the the driving engine to um, make the gameplay work. So we had to basically convert everything we had in mono behavior to the ECS um, implementation of Quantum uh, in a relatively short amount of time um, to make that work. Anything else would have... The problem was, okay, that took time, but once we accomplished that, um, it was working way faster than if we would have used the mono behavior framework and handle all the potential issues which that creates with the physics engine and glitching and all of the other things. Um, and so for us, that was the right choice because um, writing, creating a game is always a lot of work and it's 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 sometimes tedious and requires a lot of sweat and tears. But once you have a good core gameplay loop and you know what you're going for, recreating it maybe in another engine or with another um, uh, paradigm like ECS compared to modern behavior is faster than you might think because you have all the art, you have everything already there, and if you have good engineers, you can relatively quickly convert if the game is like what Cybrix is, it's like a core game loop, which you need to not... Uh, if you convert like an MMO, that is an incredibly horribly long process, evidently, but here it's like a core game loop, and you play... It's like an arcade-style game. That's why it worked quite well for this specific use case. Paul has a question. Yeah, or at least that. I do. Uh, I will lower my hand now. Uh, great to meet you guys. Uh, yeah, I'm Paul from Shapes XR. Um, not Nintendo, but I'm just wearing my Nintendo shirt today. <laughs> um, sorry I missed your talk. Uh, I was in Shapes doing our design review uh, with our design team. Um, so sorry if you guys covered this, but what I'm very curious about is um, how you guys kind of merge the spaces of uh, both players. I saw a couple of videos that like one, you know, there was a kind of a long hallway. There was another one with side by side. There's another one where it was like a portal. Did you guys mm -hmm. cover that already? Cause like that, I'm super interested in, in that. No. It's, it's a very good, oh, sorry, Angelo. I think I want to go, go ahead. ahead. Go yeah. ahead, no problem. Okay, so um, B, that was a kind of a design challenge because like, yes, you could create the game which only works for like 0.1% of people which have a living room which is over 10 meters wide. Um, so the decision we made um, for the release is that you place basically a portal inside your room. Um, and yes, you need a certain sized room, but most people probably will have that size. And what we do, we have even wider rooms, but... Um, we usually engineer the game that the ball flow, basically there's a force which attracts the ball towards you so that you don't need to move too much. And mm -hmm. the, for the for co-op, basically, we don't uh, we didn't add pass-through for that because we expect that no one would have a 10-meter wide room because you're next to each other. Um, yeah. So that's why we focus primarily on the PvP version where you fight against each other. If you'll add that in the future, not sure yet. It depends of like you know what the community wants and what uh, what kind of living arrangements most of them have. But we assume just that it's not helping much the game if we added that um, ten meter wide room where you can only so play like that the, way. So the co op one was like you have two play spaces each kind of next to yes. each other and you play from yes. the same side. And then you got the other PVP one, which is like you're off through better playing down the portal hallway. Um, yes, so, so basically have a portal okay. in your wall and you see the other player through that portal on the other side. Yep. Very cool. So we didn't use like a shared spatial anchors or, or anything that you would play in the same space, uh, primarily because at the current time, I think it's relatively rare that two people would have a headset at home playing frequently. 
Um, there are things we work on which explores that space as well. Uh, but for Cybrix and for the very early days for Quest 3, we decided not to go too far into that direction because maybe in five years when nearly everyone has multiple heads at the zone, I think that starts to get very interesting. But yeah. at the current time, we didn't think it was worth it. Makes, makes total sense. Thanks. So um, maybe for the design fellowship, we can start five minutes late. So let's say we have eight, nine minutes now. So we can get more questions. Happy to um, answer any questions. So we will make sure. Feel free to chime in. Ask directly by opening your mic or you can ask on the chat. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, guys. Uh, I want to know how do you plan to uh, expand the multiplayer? Do you have uh, any ideas in, in mind for the, the future? Maybe uh, a kind of uh, e-sport competition or seasonal championship, maybe, or a mixed reality uh, feature? Um, yes. In terms of we have ideas, we want to see how, how the community reacts or if that... Of course, we have discussed, like, what if you have a tournament and you want to have, like, you know, you start with eight players and the best ones fight at the end against each other. We tried, uh, we, we have multiple ideas. We have new modes as well planned to come in the updates, uh, maybe this year, early next year. Um, and we have, we want to explore more of the space. Currently, we, we saw when we tested with multiple people that some which are very good at the game find certain modes like less intriguing than others whereas newcomers find certain like the co-op mode is extremely friendly to new players because there's less stress and there's less of competition and we want to just see more how it evolves um more game modes for us are probably the first priority just to get more variation of the multiplayer and the, the core mechanic and then later on we might explore if the player base is large enough, then you can start to maybe have a tournament or things like that. But for us, that is only secondary once we see that the interest is high enough that you can sustain a player base which is large enough where a tournament, like a weekly tournament, would make sense. We currently have it integrated with leaderboards and probably that we will expand into multiplayer um, in a better way that you can uh, become the best two people playing, you know, co-op together. Um, so that we currently are thinking about. Um, but for the release, as it was quite um, short on time, um, we focused on just getting feedback of how the multiplayer feels of what other modes people might be interested in. Uh, Roger, it will be great if you close your camera and open because uh, we see you freeze. So yeah, perfect. Okay. So um, do you synchronize everything from physics to visual effects? via ECS or do also just broadcast an event that triggers an effect locally on so, the participant's device? Um, that is uh, peculiar for quantum. So what you do in quantum, you have a completely deterministic simulation. That means their physics engine, as well as all their math, is created in a way that even cross-platform, it is exactly the same. So if you have at the same, take the same input, the simulation will play out exactly the same way. What this means is that you only need to synchronize the inputs and then all the simulation will play out the same. And they have a very sophisticated system how you predict what the input is, that it feels very responsive, um, how they roll it back and how they reconciliate if you know, the input you predicted or where the ball is you predicted from the other players at the different position that you barely notice anything. But that allows you to actually not have to send RPC calls or do any networking for those events because it's just a simulation which plays out in each headset exactly the same way, only based on the input. And that is a very clever way to do multiplayer and it works for certain types of games extremely well. I hope that answers the question. Perfect. So uh, any other question? I mean, we can have, I think, one or two more questions before we finish. Any questions? If not, I have one question, especially from gameplay design perspective, but I would love to give the stage to others. Okay, let me ask, maybe uh, there will be other questions in the meantime. Um, if you make try to make a fitness game and try to gamify it and make it Cybrix versus if you try to make a game 
and make it a fitness uh, features, would it be different in terms of final gameplay or fitness mechanics? Because I'm pretty sure there are many people right now trying to do from different sides. Are you imagining a different game at the end or from mechanics or from fitness perspective? Does it matter from which part I would st I start? Like I'm first preparing myself. We will do a fitness uh, app, and then it we gamify and multiplayer fitness, right? I'm doing a multiplayer fitness, and then we gamify, and here we come. It's Cybrix versus. I I would say if you really focus on fitness first um, and try to incorporate every possible exercise to have a full body exercise and focus on that. I think it will be hard that you end up with a game which doesn't control the experience as much. I mean, if you want to have a pure like workout experience, um, like super uh, supernatural or a few others, there's a clear choreography. Whereas we focus more, um, like when you play soccer or basketball or, and you know, a normal sport, even though you are physically active, it's not that you follow a certain regime to exercise every muscle. So it's yeah. it's a different design philosophy and what you think is the most fun to you. For us, it's more fun to just play basically a game and you exercise while you play the game. And you can afterwards add some additional cool stuff to make it maybe more all-rounded in terms of, of the exercise. So we added two rackets instead of one. So you can use both hands more frequently instead of just one. Um, and you can try to help the user to um, exercise more parts of the body. Uh, and we have plans to maybe enhance that even further um, as it goes along. But fundamentally, it's more like a sports game and then you exercise while doing it, similar to basketball, football, or whatever you want to um, have an example. Whereas uh, Supernatural and, and, and other games, they have to exercise as the primary core and then they try to gamify to make it as pleasant as possible. I think it's different philosophies, and it depends on where you find the most fun for yourself, and you design a game in that way, and hope that others will enjoy it as well as you do. And then basically, yeah, the world decides what what they want to spend their time in. Perfect. Any final questions before we move uh, to the next session? I mean, uh, we will have Design Fellowship. Uh, this is a for people who are already sign up as fellow, uh, next session, uh, I shared some links, especially discount in case you want to join Paul's session. It will start in, I would say, two minutes. Um, one final question, maybe for quick answer. Since Quest 3, with the launch of Quest 3, there is also a body API. We can finally see our legs. Do you see any transformation on either moving games like yours or fitness? apps are you seeing that that will be affecting our experience or gameplay mechanics i think I, I can cybers, like, but generally yeah I, I think in general you probably if you could act like to track like legs which is currently not the case and we don't know exactly if that's coming i think there's a lot of exercise or if you could uh see the rest of the body you could more easily track what the user is doing um but i currently what will be possible is like track the upper body or the arms and how much that would add to exercises i currently don't know because we haven't focused on detecting shapes or detecting movement of players and how much better it would be if you know where the arm is in in a better way um or how i also we haven't fully tested yet how accurate the prediction is of where your arm is and how well that works in a consistent way for you know better estimating calories burned and all of the other stuff. So I think we, we are not yet uh, um, capable of giving a full answer to that okay. because I think if we need to experiment more. Before I remember we, can... we were teaching immerse kinematics three years ago as an advanced class. So maybe we don't need that anymore or we still need to know a little bit of immerse kinematics from a development. Immerse kinematics is um, useful for many more things than just estimating body positions. Um, if you, for example, downloaded the latest uh, Eternal Dungeons, right, they have a full body estimation and it works really well. And the person which worked on Final IK actually was part of the team or helped the team to achieve that. And it gives uh, really nice things. It's also, um, okay, if you talk about the multiplayer network game, you, 
let's say you can locally estimate very well where your arms is or X is and all the other stuff. And that's our all data points, which you need to bring across the network. And that takes a lot of data input and data bandwidth. So if you do IK inverse kinematics, you can estimate the stuff based on less position. And so for networking, that is actually beneficial. So inverse kinematics, I think right now and until we have managed to breach physics and the speed of light and manage to somehow make something, if you go in, before we reach quantum computing, I think inverse kinematics will be useful for many different things, including for network multiplayer experiences. Perfect, perfect. Thank you everyone for this short but very productive chat. Uh, I'm hoping to see you with another game uh, in the next couple of months. Who knows, you will announce another game since Quest 3 is coming. But thanks for joining. Uh, I also shared for, with everyone, we have also a fitness focused um, with again, Paul, another module next month in November with FitXR team, uh, focusing on this time mixed reality. So feel free to sign up that as well. And I just shared the Eventbrite link. So thanks everyone for joining. Thanks Roger, Phil, and Dennis, Holonetic team, uh, making this game available for multiplayer, especially. Uh, I hope we will play and then give feedback. For those who are on our Discord server, uh, please, um, uh, maybe uh, you, can, you can reply to the announcement of Cybrix. We can also distribute some uh codes to show some love to this game okay so feel free to reply to the cybrix announcements on our server thank you everyone and looking forward to seeing you in the next open lecture and have a nice rest of the day bye bye, -bye.